So the hello world, I think you're cool with. Let's go to code structure. All right, so go back to the, the opening page or, or else put in javascript.info slash structure. All right. It's going to be important that you realize, even though JavaScript is a bad language in that it lets you forget semicolons, etc., you shouldn't do that. Especially when you start working and you start doing stuff where uh, you can conceivably have uh, stuff in different files and whatever, bad things can happen if you don't put the semicolons in. I'll just leave it at that. We're going to be using use strict. Why? Because it's the right way to do things. You know how to create a comment in JavaScript. I know you do. So click the, the button on the side and they explain use strict. Do we have to go over this or are you cool with what use strict is? Okay. And again, the bottom line is if you forget to do things, most, most of those things, use strict will remind you to do them. All right. Now, I was talking to the students today. We actually wrote our first HTML. Not a lot, but we wrote a little bit. And um, then we validated our HTML and we validated our CSS. All right. There, technically, there is no validator for JavaScript. There are tools that you can use. And we will use some of them when we get to that point. Like there is JSLint. And there's ESLint, and there are some other ones. All right, but they're not truly validators like what we have in some of the other stuff. So, all right, so we use Ustrict to try to keep us, you know, whatever, on our guard. You know, should you use it? Yes. I'm going to click the next one. You know what a variable is. We talked about this already. You should be getting used to using let virtually all the time instead of var, all right? And the big thing is with var, var allows you to be really, for lack of better words, var allows you to, how do I even put this? If, if I believe that they haven't changed this, that in JavaScript, if I write a function and I create a variable in that function and I say var age equal 21, believe it or not, even though I created it in that function, it's global. You could use it everywhere. That's considered Pardon my French, but piss poor programming practice. All right, and you shouldn't do it. So by using let, let is only in the block that you're in. So that's the only place that you can use it. So it's considered a lot better way of doing things. So that's what we're going to be doing is using let. Now, var versus let, if you keep going down on here, it says in older scripts, you might find var. The var is almost the same as let. It also does it, but it does it in an old school way. And they, they go through a, a thing in here. You can read that if you care, and if you don't care, leave it alone. So variable naming, we talked about this last semester. All right, names can contain only letters, digits, symbols. The reason that they let you use the dollar sign and the underscore is you use those in other languages. And a lot of times JavaScript has to talk with other languages. That's why they allow you to do that. You're best off when you create variables, letters and digits, and it has to start with a letter. All right. So. Constants. <clears throat> Hopefully you're able to follow where, where I am. But you use the word const. Now, with ES6, and that's the JavaScript that came out in 2015, Constants are taking on more and more that where they're more and more important. And the weird thing is, and, and I'm still wrapping my head around this, you, when you do something like this, if you say const my birthday equals 18.0, etc., what they have on there, and then later you try saying my birthday equals something else, um, you, you'll get an error. All right. It'll, it'll come up in the developer console and it'll say that, you know, it's an error. You can't redefine a constant. That said, when we start working with Node, not everything, but probably 90% of the variables that you create will be constant because you won't want them to change. All right. So it used to be that all constants were put in uppercase in Node. I don't think I've seen one constant in uppercase. 
All right, so don't worry about using uppercase. All right, let's go to the next one here. Data types, we talked a little bit about this yesterday, that as far as numbers, as far as JavaScript is concerned, numbers are the same whether they have a decimal place or they don't have a decimal place. They're all considered number type. All right, you, you can go and check to see if something is, is a, a float or an int. You know what parse float is. You know what parse int is. All right, I don't care about big ints. We shouldn't have to touch on that. Going down, strings, remember, can be in single quotes and double quotes. The only thing I'm going to ask of you, and I think I've said this to you before, and that is that uh, be consistent with the way you do it. All right. Now, if, if I'm typing something in, let's say that uh, I create a variable that, that I call age, and I set age equal to 18, and I want to literally put into a string, I wish I was 18 years old again, something like that. So I can put in a string, and I can say, I wish I were, inside of double quotes, then a plus sign, then I can put in age, then another plus sign, and then I can put in years old again. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. But you don't have to do it like that anymore. There is something now that are called template literals that you typically use. And that's, see where they have the back tick right there? Yeah. They show, see how that, they have that example right down there below? That's considered a better practice. It doesn't really buy you a lot other than a little bit less typing. But virtually in our, like the book that we're going to use, et cetera, you're going to see that in there all the time, all right? Just so you get comfortable with it. Boolean, you know, no, we've talked about. <clears throat> Undefined, we've talked about. Null, you use more often than not, all right? Uh, I mean, the example they give there is fine, let age equal null. But a lot of times when you've got an object or an array and you, want it, you don't want it to hold anything, you set it to null. All right. Undefined, notice right there, um, if, if you say let age and then you do an alert, you'll get an, you, you either get an error and undefined or just the word undefined. All right, so let's see. We talked about objects and symbols. Type of, we probably won't do anything with it, but if you look at the examples that are there, I think you can look at that and figure out how type of is used. All right. So, uh, alert, prompt, and confirm. The alert we've already looked at. I don't, I don't think we're ever really going to use an alert because we really don't have to. Prompt, if you remember that from last semester, if you want to ask the user to enter something, you use a prompt statement. The one we never really touch much on, you, some people use it a lot, some never use it, and that's confirm. And you, you would say that for like, you know, would you like to go to the next page? Okay, and you can have like a yes or a no or an okay or, or, or cancel. You click okay, of course, you go to the next page. If you click cancel, you stay where you are, type of an idea. All right, going on to the next thing, they talk about type conversions. Okay, now look look at the example that they have under string conversion. Can you see that five five line example that's there? Mm -hmm. Line four, just so you know the word, that's typically said. What you're doing is you're taking that variable that you set up as a boolean, you are casting it. All right. So right now, instead of that value being true, which is a Boolean, it is the string T-R-U-E. But you can cast in this language just like you can cast in most other languages. Next semester, in the uh, when we go through some Java in the Android class, you'll learn you know, about casting because you use it a lot in there too. All right. Yeah, they've got, I don't think we even need to touch any more on conversions. I don't think there's anything else we're going to be using in there. So unary, binary, and operand, I don't think that stuff really matters. Unary operator has only got, the unary operator has only got one operand. So the example they give in there, x equals minus x, that's unary because there's only one thing with the operator itself, uh, x. Binary means it's got two operators. So if you look at the example under that, y minus x, so there's two operators. 
no big thing. Modulo, you know. All right, you can use exponentiation in here. See that example? That's still, that also is fairly new. The other thing you can do, if, for example, the one that's uh, line three that's got two, asterisk, asterisk four, which is two to the fourth, you can also say math.pow and then in parentheses, two comma four. That's the way I always do it because that's been around forever. String concatenation, what's really kind of important if you look at the, the second example that's down there, if you say one plus two, but the, the number one right there is in quotes, it's now a string. So in other words, it will make the string one, two, or it will make the string two, one, the one underneath it. Operator precedence, you should be okay if you look down about halfway on this page. It's got precedence, name, etc. That should make sense to you as far as the order in which stuff is done. And you know as well as I do that if you want to change the order, you use parentheses. All right, the equal sign is the assignment operator, nothing new there. Increment and decrement, you know plus plus, you know minus minus. The bitwise, you probably don't have to even worry about, but they are explained down towards the bottom. It's no big thing. No one uses that comma operator. All right, let's go on to the next one. Comparisons. All right. You know what greater than is, greater than or equal to, less than, less than or equal to. Let me just say, see the equals one they show there? Mm -hmm. You almost never use that. You almost always use the triple equals, which not only checks for equality, but does an identity check. So if I, if I put in the string one, two, so I put that in, in double quotes, one, two, and if I say if that is equal, equal to the number 12, it says true. But if I say equal, 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 it says false. That's the strict equality, so if you go about halfway down on this page, it explains it probably better than I just did. Don't make comparisons with null, undefined, etc. Even comparing two nulls, it'll come back false, even if they're both null. Let's go to the next one. Conditional branching, if you know what the if statement is, again, I realize some of this, at least, is going to be redundant because we've gone through it already. You know what an if-else is. You know what an else-if is. Do you remember the, uh, let's see, the conditional operator? If you go about halfway down on here, they call it the ternary operator, the question mark colon. You see that one? Okay. So if you look at the example there, it says let, let result equal condition question mark value one colon value two. If the condition is true, you take value one and assign it to result. If it's false, you take value two. All right, and there's an example of it under, underneath there. So. Logical operators are the next page. You know what ands are. You know what ors are. Like I said, this first lesson that's in here, a lot of it's review. So you know how to use that. You know what not is, which is the exclamation point. Jump to the next page. This one you probably have never used. All right, it's called a nullish coalescing operator. Is, are you there? Mm -hmm. Okay. It says it provides a short syntax for selecting a first defined variable in a list. Notice the result of A question mark question mark B means A if A is not null or it's undefined, otherwise it's B. So it's a shortcut for what they show down below in the example. Would you ever have to use that? Probably not what we're, going to, what we're going to do, but it's another new operator. Remember that um, when you do an AND or you do an OR, it does short-circuiting. 
So if you do an and and the first one's false, you don't have to check the second one. If you do an or and the first one's true, you don't have to check the second one. Going about halfway down on here, if you look under this comparison with pipe pipe, it says the important difference is pipe returns the first truthy value. Do you see that? Everything in JavaScript is considered true. Everything except zero, negative zero, the empty string, whether it's double quote, double quote, I think single quote, single quote, and that might be it. There's just, there's like four or five things. Everything else is considered true. Negative 57 is considered true. All right. Hello is considered true. While and for, I'm not even going to go through this because we you've done this before. You know how to do a while loop. You know how to do a for loop. Again, there are different kinds of for loops that you can do. They don't go into them right here, but there are different kinds. You know what a switch is. Are you comfortable with a switch statement? All right. And we're gonna we're gonna end up maybe not using a lot of this stuff so much this semester. You're going to go back and use a lot of it again next semester. All right, so let's see. All right, now functions. This, this is, I'm not going to say new, but this is stuff that really and truly does matter. All right, so the first example they show under function declaration, that's about as simple as it gets, right? But if you wanted, you know, literally to, to have it alert, hello, everyone, underneath line three, you'd have to call show message. That makes sense? And they, they show it a little later down, they call it twice. Local variables, as it says, a variable declared inside a function is only visible inside of that function. So the example they show there again, if you used var, var would live from the time you created it on. That's considered really poor programming practice. You're really and truly never, never supposed to use var anymore if you can help it. All right. You know what a parameter is by now. That's about a third of the way down. It's what you pass inside of the parentheses. You can put default parameters in. They show an example. If you go down to where it says default values, about a third or more of the way down on this page, and it shows function show message from, and it says text equal no text given. Do you see that example? If you use default parameters like that, the default parameter must be last. You can have as many defaults as you want. All right. So if you've got six parameters, they can all be defaulted. But if you've got five of them, you've got to have a non-default parameter first, followed by all the default parameters. There's Again, there's different ways that you can do this. Functions can return values. You know that. A function technically can only return one thing. So you can always return an array. Or a set of something, etc. Naming a function, all right. Just just so you see this, can you can you see that about two thirds of the way down where it says naming a function? Mm -hmm. Next semester we're not going to talk about it that much here, but next semester we'll talk a lot about what are called getters and setters. Getters start with the word get. So you walk into class the first day, I don't know you, I go hi, what's your name? You go Keegan. That's a get name. Well, as it turns out, I don't know if I told you, but I've got, it's really eight students. I don't think Dominic's coming back. So I've got eight students in there. Two of them are named Gabriel. So if I decided at the beginning of the semester, if, you know, when they were giving, telling me their names, if I would have said, you know what, from now on, you're Gabe and you're Gabriel. That's a set. So a getter retrieves something, a setter sets something. As it says under this function, equal, equal comments, a function should be short and do exactly one thing. That's how good functions are written. It's, if you're trying to do 10 things, it's better to write 10 functions that are each a couple lines than to write one program that's got a bunch of lines in it, or one, one function, I should say, with a bunch of lines in it. All right, let's go on to the next one. This is where... Yeah, you had some of this last semester, but this 
If you're going to take a look at any of this stuff, start here with function expressions. All right? Because notice it says there's another syntax for creating a function called a function expression. So the example where it says let's say hi equal function and then alert hello, say hi is now a variable that contains a function. You can do that in JavaScript. JavaScript is pretty unique. I don't know of any other language that lets you do it like that. Are there other ones? They very well could be. I don't know of any that, that is le as lenient in a lot of this stuff as JavaScript is. All right. Here, go down, if you would, about a third of the page to call back functions, please. Virtually everything you do when we get to Node, virtually everything you do is done with callback functions. So imagine, it, imagine that, that we were writing a program, and in that program, the first thing that you were supposed to do is you were supposed to go and do this really complex database query, all right? And it's going to go through a billion records, and it's going to pull out, I, we don't know how many, all right? Most programming language works work what's called synchronously. So in other words, you put that code in, it does the query, and it just sits there waiting for it to happen, all right? An example would be, and I, I mean, I think you get it, but an example would be, you know, you go to a nice restaurant. Well, if you can do that today. But you go to a nice restaurant. The waiter comes over. Can I help you? You, you make your order. The waiter goes back and, and gives the order to the cook, right? Or something like that. Then comes out and goes to the next table. Can I take your order? Imagine the waiter had to sit there and wait for your order and then bring it out. And when he was done or she was done, then they went to the next table. All right? So... The way that callbacks work is you put some code into a callback function and you go on your merry way and you do whatever it is you want to do and then when the original function finishes, it runs the callback code. And if that doesn't make sense, look at the example that's shown where it says the function should ask the question depending on the user's answer call yes or no. Can you see that? All right. The callback code is that if statement that's inside of the function. <clears throat> so it says if, if confirm question yes, else no. Now, that's not going to matter. But the one thing that, that we haven't talked about at all yet, and I know we haven't talked about Node, but most programs, the way they work, most programming languages work synchronously. If you tell the system you have 50 things you want to do, it makes 50 different processes to do that. And it does one thing. When it's done, it does the next thing. When it's done, it does the next thing. Does that make sense? That's synchronous. So imagine that's the way human conversation is supposed to be. In other words, if I'm having a talk with you, the idea is I talk until I'm finished. Then I shut up. Then you talk till you're finished. Then you shut up, etc. That's not how conversation always works, though. Sometimes people butt in, etc. So, when you use callback functions, you're working what's called asynchronously. So you allow more than one thing to happen at the same time. Now that's, that's a real short explanation. This example they show here is not doing squat to teach you about callbacks. But there is a thing later in here that we'll talk about it, okay? All right. Let's see. So function expression versus function declaration. Do you see that? All right. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. The, the declarations are easier. They are. I, to me, they make more sense because that's the way you do them in most languages. All right. The expressions are actually more powerful. And that's why a lot of people like to use them that way. Now, 
The next thing, arrow functions. Are you there? So click your next one. You use arrow functions and call back up the wazoo in Node. All right. So if you look at the example that they have right there, <clears throat> let's see. Let's go down a little bit where it says, let's see a concrete example. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. What you can do is that's called a fat arrow, the equal sign followed by the greater than sign. If you didn't do it that way, you'd say, let sum equal function a, b, then in curly braces, you'd have a plus b, or return a plus b. By using the fat arrow, you end up shortening the amount that you have to, that you have to key in. When we get to that point in Node, I'm going to show you, you can do it this way, you can do it this way. Doing it using this arrow syntax is considered new school. Doing it the other way is considered old school. And, you know, always, you, you basically, you want to be new school with the stuff that you do. You want to show people you know the latest and greatest type of stuff. Going down further on this, it says multi-line arrow functions. It says the example above show in ways how this can be used. So in other words, the big thing is what this function is going to do is it's going to have A and B passed into it. It's going to add A and B. It's going to return the result, but the actual function itself is going to be held inside of the variable sum. All right. And again, it all that's doing is it's just literally, it's just um, scratching the surface. And if you go down a little further, do you see where it says rewrite with arrow functions? Okay, you can look at that and then you can click the solution button and they show how to do it. Those aren't good examples. They're way too simplistic, to be honest with you. All right, that's it for this one. Let's jump up to the next one. <clears throat> Code structure, we know that. We know the semicolon. We know the strict mode. We know variables. You know prompt. You know alert. I mentioned confirm to you, and it's not a big thing. You know what the arithmetic operators are, what the assignment operator is, what the conditional or question mark colon operators are. You know the and and the or. We just quickly went over the nullish coalescing operator. One of those, that operator, one of the reasons they put it in is you have it in other languages. All right, so they put it in there. Loops, we talked about a while loop. You know what a switch is. You know what a for loop is. All right, you know what a do while loop is. Functions, we just talked about. All right, so nothing, you know, again, nothing new in there. All right. So when I click the next one, it's got code quality. Do you have that up there now? Yeah. And if I'm going too fast or something doesn't make sense, I'm taking for granted you're going to ask. All right. Debugging in Chrome, that's what we're going to be using. All right. So there's nothing really new there. They show you the different windows that you can use. They show you how you can set a breakpoint, et cetera. And you probably won't have to do that much of that stuff. There is other things that we're going to actually use that'll be just as easy in what we're working with. So. Syntax, if you go to the next page, it says here is a cheat sheet with some suggested rules. All right, you see that? It's, I don't think there's anything in there you don't already have that we haven't already gone over that you don't already know. You know what curly braces are, etc. You know the value of indentation. One thing you can do if you want to, and you may want to check on this, as we start writing routines and stuff that are more complex, by default, I believe Visual Studio Code tabs to four spaces. 
you might want to go and check on how to change it from four to two. All right. All right. Just a yeah, you. Comments we already know about. I said so much of this is redundant, but there were a few things I wanted to mention that were in there. I don't even know what the hell they mean by ninja code. No, using variables, etc. Whatever. We're not going to work with Mocha. That's the next page. It says automating testing with Mocha. I don't believe we do any work with that. There is a way that you can, that, that some people code, and it's actually pretty popular. You may or may not have ever heard of it. It's called Test Driven Development, or TDD. And what it, what it means is you literally write your tests before you write your code. And what that means is every test you write is going to fail, right? Because you don't have the code written yet. So you write the test knowing it's going to fade, fail rather. Then you write the code and then run the test again. All right. And the idea is by, make, by writing your tests first, you think of things that you probably wouldn't have thought of otherwise. All right. So they got behavior. I don't know if they put test driven development in here or not, but you've at least heard the term. Polyfills, you may or may not have heard of on the next page. <clears throat> and <clears throat> says, let's see, good place to see the current speech. Polyfills were really important back in the day where some people were, were using real old versions of um, Internet Explorer. So the idea was when you had code written, <clears throat> What polyfills would help do is if, these, if the system didn't understand the code you were using, it just would basically, I'm not going to say fill it in with nothing, but polyfill is kind of like fill it in with something phony so it wouldn't break. Right. Babel, we will look at when we, <clears throat> when we get into the node stuff. It says Bab Babel is what's called a transpiler. What does that mean? It says it rewrites modern JavaScript code into the previous standard. So in other words, it makes sure that JavaScript will work with earlier versions of software. All right. Next is objects. It says here objects, the basics. This stuff, just so you know, we did absolutely nothing with object-oriented program. I don't know if you agree with that, but that was one of the chapters. I may have went over part of it like the last day or one of the last days of class. JavaScript is really unique in the way that it used to do all object-oriented programming. You didn't make classes and stuff like we did in C-sharp. You didn't do a lot of stuff. Not only that, once you created something, you could just say, I forgot to add that. You could just add it and it would work. A lot of stuff you can't do in other languages. Some people love that, and that's one of the reasons they're so nuts about JavaScript. Other people couldn't stand it, and they were like, why don't you do the way you do it the way other places do it with constructors, etc. So now JavaScript lets you do it either way. It lets you do it the old-fashioned type of way with um, using a bunch of what are called prototypes, or you can do it the newfangled way. All right, so if you take a look, go down a, right near the top of the page, you see where it says literals and properties. Can you see that? All right, this is the first time basically in here you've seen it. This is a JSON object. Its name is user. Use, if, if I say console.log user.name, it'll show John. If I say console.log user.age, it'll show 30. Does that make sense? So it's the name of the object dot the name of the property. All right.
Now go down, if you would, a little further. There's a box that says object with const can be changed. You see that? Yeah. Okay. That's a key thing to realize. What that means is, notice what they've done. They say const user equals name John, then later they say name equal Pete. You can't do that with non-objects. So you can't say const age equal 21, then later say age equal 26. That'll give you an error, all right? Because you're working with what are called primitives. But if you're working with an object, you can change the guts, so to speak, of the object. And that's important because there will be times when we are working in Node where we will want to be able to go in and change the value of an object that has been created using const. Okay. All right. Um, okay. If if you take a look, there's I I don't even exactly want to go go through this, but we can. All right. Go down a little further, and they talk about square bracket notation. All right. And. Anytime you write something using the curly braces like we used, you can also do it using brackets. I don't ever, ever do it that way because to me it's harder to do. All right? Some people like that, so you can read that, and if you want to use that, you can use it. Go down, if you would, about halfway. There's a thing there that says property value shorthand. Go down to the second example. Look, if you can, look at both the, the first example and the second one. If you're using the same name for the property as the variable will have, see how they have name, name, age, age? There's a shortcut. You can do it that way. Now, some people look at that and they're like, I'd rather do it the first way. The second way is too confusing. Then do it the first way. So properties, basically, you, we, you worked with them last semester. A property is what an object has that's not a method. So for instance, you, you've got a first name, a last name, a height, a weight, a gender, etc. Those are all properties. But if I talked about you know, Keenan.sleep, Keenan.eat, those are methods. All right. So they talk a little bit about both those in here. Now, notice if you go down a little further, there's something that says a for in loop. Can you see that? All right. When you've got an example like that, it says for key an object. See that? All right. First of all, you don't need to use the word key, but you can. All right. And if you look at the example that they have in here, let user equal, and they say for let key and user. You see all that stuff? Mm -hmm. You are creating that variable on the fly, that key variable, basically. And in that case, you would use key. The key is name. The value is John. The key is age. The value is 30. The key is is admin. The value is true. All that make sense? And again, I you know you might look at this and go, yeah, I'm not really getting anything. Well, you, Believe it or not, you're getting something out of this because it's allowing me to talk about stuff that we're going to be hitting on later. All right. All right. When they say one of the, go to the next one, object copying and references. And they say there, one of the differences between objects and primitives is primitives are stored by reference. All right. Imagine that I say, um, let age equal 21, okay? If I go into memory and I find where in memory age is, okay? It's going to have literally the, the binary equivalent of 21. So it's a bunch of zeros, et cetera, that are going to equal 21. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if I create one of those objects like I just showed you with a name, an age, is admin, et cetera, if I go to that thing in memory, it's not going to have the it's not going to have the information in there. It's going to have the address of where in in, for, in in memory the information is. So primitives hold a reference, or I'm sorry, objects hold 
a reference or an address where primitives hold the actual value. And they explain that with their pictures and the like that they show there. But All right. So uh, going down about halfway, it says cloning and merging ob object dot assign. It says copying an object variable creates one or more references to the same object. All right. And you can make a clone. And a clone does, notice if you look at the example there, it says let clone equal curly brace, curly brace. It's a brand new empty object. And then notice what they do. It says for key and user, clone key equal user key. Can you see that example? Typically, when you work with most types of objects, it's like with an array. You can't just sit there and say one array equals another array. You've got to take everything that's in the first array, put it in a loop, and copy it to the second array. You do pretty much the same kind of thing here. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, let's jump to the next one. Garbage collection. The, the key thing to realize is garbage collection. What, what that means is occasionally when the operating system has some time, it checks to see if there's, there, there are things that are not being used. Let me try to give you an example. And, and you're probably too young to, to understand this, but you may or may not be. Have you ever heard, uh, and maybe I even told this to you in the other, one of the other classes, I don't know. Do you ever hear of somebody who, their, their job, they're a meter maid? In other words, let, let's assume that in Rankin, there was uh, two hour parking everywhere you go, okay? The whole back lot, let's just assume, is two-hour parking. So what happens is, as soon as you park, literally, when people come in here at 12, there's somebody who comes and puts a little chalk mark underneath your tire. Then comes back two hours later, and if that chalk mark is still there, they know you've been there more than two hours. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, so they can give you a ticket. So the reason I'm telling you that is that's kind of the way the operating system does it. It goes and it looks through memory and it says, oh, this isn't being used. So it flags it as not being used. Then when it comes around again, if it's still not being used, it removes that and it frees up the memory. Does that make a little bit of sense? Yeah. Okay. All right, let's jump to the next one. One of the hardest things for most people to understand, and I screw it up, where it says object method, methods this. It's the, the keyword this. This normally means whatever object you're talking about. And usually the way you use it, it's not only the current object, but it's the current element in the current object that you're talking about. So again, they have this user, John, and 30, and then they show you an example, all right? Uh, I don't know if that was a great example, the one that they put in here. Here, let's jump down about a third of the way down where it's got this in methods, okay? Much of the time when you use the word this, you don't even need it. What you're going to find when we do Java next semester is depending on how you set up your programs, sometimes you must use the word this, excuse me, and sometimes it doesn't matter one way or the other whether you use the word this. And they even mention under this is not bound in JavaScript, keyword this behaves unlike most programming variables. It can be used virtually anywhere in any function except arrow functions if you go down a little further it says arrow functions do not allow you to use the word this if you try to you get an error message right. um, going to the next one hopefully you're there constructor comma operator new this is similar to the way that we learn how to do object-oriented programming in C-sharp. And it's also going to be similar to the way that we'll go over it 
in the Java class in spring. So you're, when you create, if you look at the example they have there, it's got function user, name, etc. And then it's got um, let user equal new user. If you've got a function that starts with a capital letter like that, and it's the same name basically as, you know, we're creating a new user there. And what that's going to do is it's automatically going to call a function called user. That's the constructor. All right. So notice what they're passing in there. They're passing in Jack. So where it says this dot name equal name, the name will automatically be set to Jack. All right. This dot admin there, since they're not passing anything in, since they're not passing anything in, it'll automatically be set to false. We're not going to do a heck of a lot of work with this stuff, so I don't think that that's going to matter much to you anyway. All right. Optional chaining, if you go up to the next one. We'll finish this one up, then we'll take a break. Chaining means you say something, dot, something, dot, something. All right, they show what you cannot do under where it says the problem. See that? Mm -hmm. It says alert user dot address dot street. You can't do that. But if you remember, because we did a little bit of it in jQuery, in jQuery, we could say use something dot something else dot something else. All right. And the reason that that's important is it automatically, when it changes it, chains it, says do the first thing. When you're done, do the second thing. When you're done, do the third thing. You can chain together as many things as you want. They will run synchronously, meaning it'll, it, it won't start the second one until the first one is done, etc. Short circuiting we already talked about. Symbols they talk about, again, not just emojis. There's all sorts of different symbols you can use probably is not going to ever be all that important to you, in my opinion. I could be wrong. Object to primitive conversion. All right. And notice there is a, it says they're too primitive. We can fine tune string and numeric conversion using special object methods. So when you, when you want to make an apple act like an orange, is what they're saying when you there's some of this stuff that you can do and basically a lot of it just involves casting now there's a symbol about halfway down symbol dot to primitive all right it says there's a built-in symbol named symbol dot to primitive that should be used to name conversion methods i've never even worked with any of this stuff i've never had the re the, the, the need to all right the next one down though is important It'll be important this semester. It'll be important next semester. When you use value of, let's say that I set a, I've got a string and I set it to double quote, one, two, three, double quote. The, the numeric value of that string is zero. Does that make sense? Because it's a string. But if I use value of and I pull that out and put it into a numeric variable, it's now 123. We'll jump through this data types and we're taking a break. So methods of primitives. Objects. Like I said, I'm trying to hit things that I think are important to you. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. Numbers you already know. They, they mentioned there are more than one way to write a number. Nothing new in there. You know this stuff. It's got parse int and parse float in it. All right. And some of the other math functions like math.random, you've used all this stuff. Strings, how you have to use single quotes or double quotes. So we've talked about that. There is a there are really good things in here, just so you know. What I mean is under the strings, you know how to use two upper and two lower. That stuff makes sense. One thing we probably didn't spend enough time on last semester or could have spent more time on were some of the substring functions. So, for instance, if I've got a real long string and I want to see if a, a certain sequence of characters is in there or maybe is in there more than once type of an idea, 
I, I actually figured out a way with one of the things I'm working on right now. We're going to use that in one of the first applications that we write when we get into Node. So hopefully then, you know, you'll have a lot better example of how that's used then. But they've got things they show in here. Halfway down, it's all on substrings. I'm not going to run through this. But, I mean, if you want some more, you can take a look and you can find out a heck of a lot. All right. Arrays. Again, we did, what we did with arrays was we filled up things with arrays, right? But we didn't do things like pushing and popping, shifting and unshifting, etc. But if you go down in here, about a third of the way, it says methods pop, push, shift, and unshift. And it says push adds an element to the end of the array. Shift gets an element from the beginning of the array. Pop gets an element from the end of the array. And shift appends an element to the beginning. So they're kind of opposites of one another. All right, so push and pop, shift and unshift. So there's, you know, again, there's more information on it right there. Loops, yeah, they talk about the for loop. You know what the length property is for an array. When you create an array, there's there's several ways that you can do it. If you go down about two-thirds of the way, it says new array. I don't know if you can find that. That is pre-filling an array. There's not a problem at all with doing that. That's totally fine to do that. You if if you you could have said right there, let's say you didn't know what values you wanted to put in that array. You could have either said let ARR equal new array paren paren with nothing in it. Or you can say let ARR equals bracket bracket. That's another way that you can create a brand new array. And that's pro I'm sure that's said in here someplace. All right, going to the array methods, as it says, there's, there's push and pop, shift and unshift. Splice is used to delete an element from an array. Slice says it's similar, is a much similar than the similar looking splice. All right. They both pretty much do the same thing. Splice changes the actual array, and I think slice does not. You can use concat to add stuff to an array. There's a for each loop that you can use. It's about a third of the way down on here. It's one way to cycle through an array. I always tell people, hey, if, if, you, if it confuses you, don't use it. Let's see. Uh, go down, if you would, a little less than halfway. It says transform an array. It says, the first one they show there is map. The array.map is one of the most useful and often used. It calls the function for each element and returns an array of results. So one thing you can do with map, all right, it says here we transform each element into its length. So instead of Bilbo, it's got five. Instead of Gandalf, it's got seven. Instead of Nazgul, it's got six type of an idea. But that's actually... Sometimes what you care about, for example, is the size of something, not what it contains. So mapping is one thing you can use. Sort you know about. There is no reverse. Well, technically there is a reverse sort. All right. You look at that a bit. But there's also, you can sort and then run reverse on it too. All right, this is a decent enough place to stop. So let's let's take 10 right here. It's 130. Let's let's start back up again at 140.